This criminal investigation started in the city of Odessa in August of 1965, at the peak of a vacation season. Early in the morning, a plasterer, Zinaida Subota, knocked on the window of a room rented by a young couple from Leningrad, Sergei and Anna Semyona. The woman wanted to claim back her painting tools. Noticing that the door was open, she walked in to see a dead woman with a wound on her temple lying on the floor. Her husband was not there. A communal building was a housing arrangement uniquely specific of the USSR. Only rooms in the apartments were partitioned, while the bathroom and kitchen were of the shared use. In the open space, nothing could be hidden from neighbors. What made the room becoming a crime scene peculiar was an individual entrance. Neighbors failed to recall something that would matter. One of the tenants was blind for years. The other one, though, told that a fight sparked between the spouses a few days ago. Anna didn't want to let her husband go somewhere. Later, everything settled down, however. The plasterer told that she had offered Sergei some part-time job after learning that he was an electrician. She is busy redecorating an apartment next door, and the tenants need rewiring. Sergei agreed. He would spend mornings on the beach and worked in the afternoon, earning decent fees. He used Zineida tools. When she saw her spatula wasn't where it had to be, Zineida went to ask Sergei. She didn't know why he was not at home. Forensic experts established time of the death, about midnight. The blow was not powerful, but it struck a vulnerable spot, a temporal bone. The agony lasted for a few minutes. The wound shape and hematoma suggested that she was stricken with a round edge object, possibly with a bottle. Injuries on her earlobes made it clear that the victim's earrings were removed. Blood and epithelium particles under fingernails meant that the victim tried to resist. The murderer is definitely supposed to have deep scratches. A bloody footprint left by a narrow shoe was found on the floor. Most likely it was left by a belt, as the slow heel shoe model was called in the 60s. The mild blow and a boat footprint gave grounds to suggest that the murderer was a female. A fingerprint on the door handle was not Anna's. Another find was a small pearl in the victim's hair. It could have dropped out of the stolen earring. As the examination was underway, detectives heard screams of the returning husband. Sergei's face had scratches and bruises. He tried to break into the room, demanding access to the body. It was not unusual for detectives to see a perpetrator seeking to assure everyone of his or her innocence by faking grief. Lucky Lou started to flock around, including people who rented rooms for their vacations. An officer decided to show Sergei to the crime scene to talk to him without unnecessary witnesses. A restless little boy was an annoying interference with the tragic setting. His playing Indians was a nuisance to everybody. His granny took away a colored feather he had found on the gateway. When the blind neighbor heard about the feather, she pensively muttered the name Lala. The victim's husband checked their belongings and reported Anna's wallet and golden earrings with corundum missing. The young woman never had jewelry with pearls. Sergei also said he had not spent the night in his room but was nearby. He was wiring the empty apartment next door. He finished work at around 10, took a walk in the park. Some local bullies hit him on his head, he fainted, and came to in the morning. The story did not sound too credible. The man's testimony did not hold water, but he kept insisting. Do they think he beat himself up? An officer's assistant interrupted the conversation, showing the colorful feather he collected from the little boy. The blind neighbor told that at about 11 p.m. last night, she heard the jangling of coins, which led her to conclude that the notorious Gypsy Lala showed up. She made her living by telling fortunes her belt was embroidered with jangling coins and she wore a bandana with colored feathers. Sergei knew nothing about the Gypsy, but mentioned that his late wife was fond of mystique. She would see healers and occultists and had more trust in them than in doctors. It seemed that in pursuit of diverting suspicions from himself, the man was ready to exploit any hypothesis. A detective took note of his shoes, narrow and small size. The footprint, which they initially identified with female boats, could well belong to him. 
Yet the forensic examination revealed that blood under the victim's fingernails did not match Sergei's group, and nor did the bloody footprint coincide with his. Sergei was released on bail. Meanwhile, detectives managed to find Lala's address to pay her a visit. Her apartment was locked, but her neighbors told that soon enough she would be back. Lala owns a pet bird who she will never abandon. The gypsy showed up late at night. She sneaked quietly, trying to remain unnoticed, but detectives and witnesses were waiting for her at home. A pet crow was sitting on a policeman's shoulder. Lala attempted an escape and custom blackguarded the uninvited guests, to no avail, however. Her home was carefully searched. A wallet looking like the stolen one and earrings with red corundum were found. The gypsy wore narrow boat-shaped shoes and a bandana with dyed feathers. Swore that she indeed was at Semyonov's apartment, but did not kill Anna. The collected evidence, however, testified to the opposite. Lala was detained for further investigations. A young woman, Anna Semyonova, murdered in a rented apartment in Odessa. Death caused by a blow with a round-shaped object in the victim's temporal bone. A footprint left by a boat-shaped shoe and a small fingerprint on a door handle lead to conclude that the murderer is female. A blind neighbor recalls a gypsy fortune teller, Lala, showing up by the building. Lala is detained, her apartment searched. Police find items belonging to the victim. The gypsy denies committing the murder. Forensic examination results are controversial. The fingerprint on the handle does belong to the fortune teller, but her blood does not match the epithelium found under the victim's nails. This is not enough to acquit the suspect. Detectives suggest that she was not alone to commit the crime. An accomplice could have been there. Lala swears there was no one with her. She pledges to help the investigation if she is allowed to give the full account. The detectives let her speak out. The fortune teller told that Anna came to see her once. She asked to tell her fate confessing of falling in love. While the husband was busy with his side hustle, Anna fell for a local married man. The young woman did not disclose his name, just mentioning that the guy worked as a mechanic. She showed the gypsy a note written by her romance and asked to delve into his secret thoughts based on his handwriting. Lala said nothing mean about Anna's new acquaintance, but wondered if it was really worth jeopardizing her fate for a momentary love adventure. Anna's husband was relatively well-to-do. His father, as Lala found it, is well-established too. Anna replied that she was quite wealthy without the husband's earnings. The fortune teller, for sure, could not ignore these words. She offered Anna to conjure her wealth to bringing luck and love. The young woman liked the idea and invited Lala to come to her place. She didn't even feel she already was under the influence of the gypsy's hypnosis. To stay unnoticed, Lala remained out of the building, saying that her conjuring exercise will take place right here. Anna left. Lala waited for another 10 minutes, but her client was not back. The fortune teller hated to miss the prey. She went up the stairs, saw an open door, walked into the room to see dead Anna on the floor. The gypsy's first instinct was to run away, but then she saw a wallet. Taking earrings as well looked like a good idea too. She could not comment on the pearl found at the crime scene. She did not wear any pearls. The note found at her place? Detectives could keep it. Lala remembered its text by heart. Anya, I gave the letter to Gran. She's blind anyway, won't see a thing. I'm out for a weekend to see kids, back on Monday. Your neighbor kisses. If the gypsy was telling the truth, the note suggested that the mysterious lover lived next to the victim. And the blind old woman is his granny. Claudia took the detective's questions with a good deal of suspicion. Yet, she told that her grandson's name was Gennady and he lived out of town. However, the last two months he has been in Odessa due to tensions with his wife. She did indeed pass the note over to Anna, as he asked. Obviously, she had no idea about the note content. The man was planning to restore a fireplace in the building and the young woman was an architect. So it was essentially about working communication. Claudia said that her grandson had left, but a neighbor interfered and objected. 
The guy is here, along with his family. Gennady really was restoring a fireplace. Policeman's questions made him nervous. He asked that his wife and kids be taken away and explained that he barely knew Anna. Nothing but saying hi to each other, detectives displayed his note. Gennady had to admit he had a relationship with the victim. It grew out of nothing. He never planned anything serious. Then he made up with his wife and moved the family to Odessa. The detective hinted that at some point the mistress could have become an encumbrance. Gennady objected. Anna was a modest and well-mannered person. She would never set him up before the wife. Besides, he was not in the city on the day of murder. A young woman, Anna Semyonova, murdered in a rented apartment in Odessa. Death caused by a blow with a round-shaped object in the victim's temporal bow. Gennady Biruk, residing in the building, is a suspect. He had romantic relations with the murdered woman. An attempt to silence her against talking about the affair, as Gennady made up with his wife, is considered as a possible motive. Detective's conversation with the suspect was interrupted by a noise from outside. A neighbor named Vera was defending her grandson against Sergei's attempt to seize a pillowcase filled with some items. As Sergei noticed the detective, he said he needed nothing at all and tried to walk away. The detective stopped him. The incident began when the boy sneaked into the basement and found there a pillowcase filled with some utensils. Sergei saw him and claimed it was his property. The detective looked in to see tableware made of gold and silver. Among the assorted articles, there was a beer mug inlaid with pearls. An identical pearl was found by the victim's body. Sergei no longer insisted on the possession of the stuff. Blind Claudia intervened with the conversation. She told that before the revolution, the building was owned by a sugar manufacturer, Justina. The finding could well be his hidden treasure. This assumption, however, raised doubts. The utensils could have been quite old, but the pillowcase was relatively new. A label on it said that it was made in Belarus city of Orsha. Bed linens were in very short supply in the USSR, almost unavailable in retail stores. People could use two or three sets for decades, stitching and restitching bedclothes time and again. The clothes made by Ivanova and Orsha factories were in the highest demand. When boutique The Ganges opened in Moscow, Indian men bed linen sets became a must-buy there for countless customers. And it was not only because of the quality. Unlike the Soviet production, Indian linen was colorful and had original patterns. A set of bedclothes was regarded as a perfect wedding gift. It was an indispensable part of a fiancé's dowry parents would start to put together as early as at her school years. After applying for an official marriage, newlyweds were entitled to purchase rarely available goods subject to the so-called invitation. This document allowed to purchase two sets of bed sheets, blanket covers and pillowcases, one table sheet and four towels. The detective walked all the rooms in the communal apartment to examine the tenant's bedclothes. Nothing similar was found until the last room was checked. It was rented by lodgers spending their summer vacations in Odessa. For some reason, a woman declined showing her bedclothes and said their vacation was almost over and they were about to leave for home. The man, however, understood that there was no choice and agreed. The linens under the cover looked very similar to the found pillowcase. The detective asked them to identify themselves. The man said he was Dmitry Semyonov. Semyonov is obviously not the rarest family name, but it could hardly be a coincidence with the victim's name. Those were the parents of Sergei Semyonov, Anna's husband. Experts in antiquities examined the content of the pillowcase. It was a genuine treasure, mainly cutlery from the 19th century, produced by the famous Sazikov Company. The detective presented the beer mug on which particles of Anna's blood were found earlier. Officers were certain that there must be some scratches on Dmitri's body as she tried to resist her murderer. Dmitri started to confess. His real last name was Justina, and he was a son of the sugar manufacturer. The building they rented a room in used to belong to his father. 
After the revolution, his parents fled abroad while he, a young romanticist, swept by revolutionary ideas, chose to stay. His father sent him a letter explaining that fleeing from the Bolshevik country was most likely impossible now, but the guy could count on the heritage. Fearing that the letter could end up in the wrong hands, the father went for an elliptic wording. There is a little something from Sazikov's at home for you. Make sure you warm your hands by the fireplace first. Dmitri tried to convince officers that he was quite well off and would never claim the treasure but for his son. A few years ago, Sergei fell into a company of gamblers and happy life turned into an inferno. The father lost all of his savings to repay his car debts. He begged the son to quit playing. However, one day last May, Sergei came home beaten up. He confessed of owing 15,000 rubles. The father did not resort to the police protection. It would put an end to his career and reputation. Instead, he went on to look what his father once hid. He thoroughly conceived a whole operation. Sergei and his wife Anna came to Odessa first and rented an apartment. Alongside that, they learned that another apartment on a lower story was available for rent. Also, they checked information about fireplaces and found out that two of them were bricked up long ago. To get access to one of them, Sergei took a part-time job of electrician. The second one was Anna's responsibility. She kicked off an affair with Gennady and talked him into unbreaking the fireplace. Unexpectedly for the family, though, Anna got really overwhelmed with their relationship. She spent more and more time with her passion. The parents told her son about her behavior, but he was distracted with something else. He found a company in Odessa to play with and was out of home most of the time. On the murder day, he was playing as well. There were no bullies uh, beating him up. He was mugged for car deaths. The situation called for an action and Dmitri went to talk to his daughter-in-law privately. As he entered the room, he saw a bundle in Anna's hands. Dmitri realized that she had found the treasure. He demanded explanations, but Anna rudely replied she had no time for a chit-chat. She did not control herself as if she was hypnotized. Her speech was blurred and inconsistent. Dmitri tried to seize the bundle from her hands. All the items dropped out of the pillowcase. Dmitri recognized the mug he had last seen 40 years ago. Anna went on resisting. Dmitri lost control and was not himself when he hit Anna on the head with a mug. The man said he never meant to kill her. It was an outburst of emotions. He did not say a word about the killing to his wife and buried the treasure back, hoping to eventually sell it. He agreed to a full confession and eagerly cooperated with the investigation. Court sentenced him to eight years in prison. After five years, he was released but never managed to restore his good reputation.